Good morning. Good morning. We're glad you've chosen to uh, worship with us on this uh, Memorial Day Sunday. And of course, Memorial Day is a day that uh, we um, pause to remember. Uh, and so just before we go ahead, I would just like to ask, um, let, let me do it this way. Someone said something to me after the f first service, which made me think. If you served in one of the armed forces, or since it's Memorial Day, if you lost someone who served in the armed forces, would you stand and let us recognize you this morning? Thank you. Thank, thank you for your service. Uh, we're, glad, we're glad that you're here. Um, if you're here for the first time, we have a gift we'd love to give you, and the way you get that gift is to tear off the little perforated part of your bulletin and um, fill out the information that you want us to have, and then after the service is over, uh, you can take it out here to the counter and give that tab to someone there, and they'll give you a, a bag a bag of goodies, and so we hope you'll do that. If you're here regularly, then just fill that thing out and put it in the basket like you do every week, and we appreciate it. We, we got, a, we got a, uh, uh, a great service. I was noticing, maybe it's just on the back screen, but I was noticing that my name seems smaller than yours. Is there a, <laughs> is there a reason for that, you think? I worked hard at making them the same, so okay. I'll go back and adjust it. Uh, yeah. Well, I don't want them the same. I, uh, <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll make sure it flashes, Matt. <laughs> We're going to have a great time. Let me pray, and then we'll start. Father, thank you for this day that we come together to remember. You are a God of remembrances. And in fact, in just a few moments, we're going to share in the Lord's Supper, which was given in part to help us remember the death of Jesus, his body represented by the bread and his blood represented by the juice. And so, Father, we know that you intend for us to remember, and we do remember today. And we thank you for this time that we can come together as believers and offer our praise uh, to, to you and to honor you and glorify Christ. I pray this in his name. Amen. Amen. I don't know. On that screen, it looks the same. So, <laughs> Well, we are so glad that you are here this morning, uh, church. And if you're a visitor, we're so glad that you're here this morning. I tell you what, we are just God's people singing God's praises and God's presence. Amen. Love that line. And this morning, we're going to, first song that we're going to sing, Psalms 8 9 says, Oh Lord, oh Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. I know earlier in the week it was kind of miserable with all the rain. But have you looked outside today, yesterday, and today? It's like, wow, it's amazing what God is doing. So let's celebrate Him today. And if you've never been here before, well, we are a participatory church and we're expecting a lot out of you today. All right, stand up. Come on. Put your hands together. Help me out now. Majestic is your name in all the earth. Oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. The heavens declare your greatness, the oceans cry out to you, the mountains they bow down before you. So I'll join with the earth and I'll give my praise.
us freedom today. Stay standing as we sing this song. Alright, let's sing together. Child of God, yes, 
am a child of God. Yes, I am. Amen, church. Amen. That ought to put a smile on your face where it hurts. Ugh. I'm a child of God. Amen? Amen? Do you realize that today? Would you bow your heads with me for just a second? Would you take just a second and thank God right now? You're a child of God if you know him. And that's all that matters. Whom the Son hath set free, you are free indeed. You're no longer bound to that stuff, even though it still happens. He forgives us. Thank you, Jesus, for what you've done. You are so amazing. And we just lift you up this morning because it's all about you. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Start that again, please. I'm sorry.
Amen. Thank you so much, Molly. God has blessed this church with so much talent, and I'm so thankful for it. Yeah, amen. Amen. I'm so thankful for all of those that, that share that talent. The name of her song was Here I Am, Lord. If you have a talent or a gift that God has given you, have you said, here I am? Is there somewhere you could fill in? If it's music or singing, see Mike, would love to have you in the choir or on the praise team. If it's in another area of service, see Gary, our involvement minister. We'll get you involved. There's no greater joy than serving God with the gift he has given you. And he will bless you because he's a good, good father. Let's stand and continue this time of worship with good, good father.
Christ alone my hope is found. He is my life, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving cease, my comforter. alone who took on flesh fullness of God in helpless faith this gift of love and righteousness scorned by the ones he came to save till on that cross as Jesus died the wrath of God was sad Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for this beautiful day you've given us, for the opportunity and ability to come together as your children and praise your holy name in freedom. Lord, as we come to this time of communion, we're reminded by the bread of what you did for us as we take this bread and it's crushed between our teeth. We remember how your body was crushed for our transgressions. 
all the sins of the world were laid on your body and you were separated from God. As we take it as juice, we're reminded of the blood that was shed, the cleansing blood that washes our sins away so that we may spend eternity with you. Lord, we thank you for this great gift and we remember it at this time. In Christ's precious name, amen. May be seated. Thank you, Lynn. Today is the birthday of God's church. It was established on what we call the day of Pentecost. And the story is found in Acts chapter 2. I hope you will read the entire chapter later. Uh, I am going to put on the screen some selected verses from chapter 2, but it will be more meaningful uh, if you read the entire chapter uh, later on. So in honor of God's word, would you stand while I read these scriptures? When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues as of fire, distributing themselves, and they rested on each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues, 
as the Spirit was giving them utterance. But Peter, taking his stand with the eleven, raised his voice and declared to them, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart, and they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And with many other words, he solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. So then those, that, those who had received his word were baptized. And that day there were added about 3,000 souls. You may be seated. There's an outline in your bulletin if you um, want to follow. That'd be, that'd be great. Pentecost um, has a couple different meeting, m- meanings. Uh, literally, it is 50 days after the Passover Sabbath. So that means that it always falls upon what is called in the Bible the first day of the week. It's what we call uh, Sunday. Now, from a, a Jewish standpoint, Pentecost was a feast day, and it celebrated the end of the grain harvest. But because God started the church on that feast day, for Christians, it becomes something we celebrate because the church began on that, on that day. And the beginning is recorded in that second book, second chapter of Acts, that part of which we just read. The, the book of Acts, especially the first 12 chapters, records the early days or ye- and years of the, of the New Testament church. And when you read the book of Acts, um, you will find some amazing things that went on in the church. A few years ago, I decided that I was going to read one chapter from the book of Acts every day as my daily Bible reading. So there's 28 chapters in the book of Acts, and so that meant that um, there were 28 Uh, 28 chapters, some months there are 30 days, some 31, so that gave me a little buffer. If I missed a day, I could, I would, I would not be fall so far behind. And I decided that at the end of each month, I did, I would have gone through the entire book, and so I'd start the next month with the first chapter again. But I read through the book of Acts that month from a different translation. So January, say, I read from the New American Standard Bible, which is there in the seats with you. Maybe in February, I don't remember, but maybe in February I read the entire book of Acts from the uh, J.B. Phillips translation. Maybe in March I read from the NIV. And so it gave me uh, a different insight. I was amazed at how many different things I learned just from reading from uh, different, different translations. And I began to make a list uh, of things that I've learned uh, by, by reading through uh, the book of Acts that many times. And uh, uh, some of you have heard a lot of those sermons that I got from reading through the book of Acts that many, that many times. It's amazing what God tells us about his church in, in that book. So I... I've picked uh, six things that I want to share with you this morning about the church. And they all begin with the the letter P. It took me three days to uh, find enough letters, enough words that started with the letter P to fill this outline. So you got the first letter of each one of those blanks uh, of the main points. The first thing is that the church was planned church was planned. Now, I think it's unfortunate that a fairly significant theology today 
teaches, in essence, that the church was kind of a plan B. Their theology teaches that Jesus came first time to reestablish the Jewish kingdom, but he couldn't do it because of the unbelief of, of the Jews. And so he went back to heaven intending to come again and make another attempt. And this time he would succeed, even if it meant that he had to use force, and he would have to use force in this, in this view. And so what's, what's going to happen between his failure in the first time and his success in the second time? Well, that's where the church uh, is sometimes viewed as a stopgap uh, plan, that the church was never intended by God, but it because Jesus couldn't establish the kingdom, it began and in order to have something during those intervening years. Well, I think that's, uh, that's an unfortunate view. There, first of all, it's not in the Bible. It's not scriptural. And, and second of all, the Jesus that I know and the Jesus that I serve never failed in anything. He was successful in everything that he did. So I would, I would reject that theology uh, right off the start. Because my, my belief is that the church is God's original and only plan. Indeed, God called the Jewish nation as the means of bringing the Messiah into the world. Um, and he, God made a covenant with them uh, and that covenant, uh, as we learn in the New Testament, was temporary. That there was coming a better covenant, a replacement covenant. And that the replacement covenant, we're told, is a better covenant. We have a whole book in the New Testament, the book of Hebrews, that, that expands on that. Thirteen times in the book of Hebrews, uh, something better about the new covenant is, is mentioned. I tried to say some of them in the first service, and I drew a blank, but things like a better covenant and a better sacrifice, those kind of things, uh, a better high priest. Um, so those kind of things in the new covenant are better than in the old covenant. And that, is, that was God's plan from, from the beginning. And in fact, we just celebrated communion. And in Luke chapter 22, Luke records that event of the celebration of communion, the instituting of communion. And Jesus, when he gave the cup to him, said this blood is the blood of the new covenant. And so the new covenant began through the blood of Jesus. Um, make no mistake, make no mistake, the church was not a stopgap plan. The church was God's plan from the beginning. Secondly, the church is powerful. And we see that through the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit. In fact, I, I like to describe the Holy Spirit with that one word, power. And one of the characteristics of the church that you will discover when you read uh, the book of Acts is that the church was a display, and especially the beginning of the church was a display of God's power. It was promised. Jesus told uh, his followers, and behold, I am sending forth the promise of my Father upon you. But you are to stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. That's talking about God's spirit that would be displayed in the beginning of the church. Now, I believe there are two dynamics with that power. And, and both of them demonstrate the great power that, is, that comes from the Holy Spirit. I believe, first of all, the Holy Spirit provides what I call an equipping power, equipping power. Part of what we see on the day of Pentecost 
was what we have already seen in the Old Testament many times. The, the Holy Spirit is in the Old Testament many times. Uh, in the Old Testament, God's Spirit often came upon people and for the purpose of equipping them to do a particular task. There's a man by the name of Bezalel who God gave his spirit to in order that he might successfully uh, craft the tabernacle there in the desert. He was gifted to do that. Some, many of the judges, the Bible tells us that God's spirit came on them in order to give them power to be a judge. Some of the kings, it says God's power came on them. Uh, it, it, it equipped them to do particular tasks. But it also provided testimony. It, it, it equipped them and it provided testimony. Micah, uh, one of the prophets, says in Micah 3.8 that he was filled with the power of the Spirit of the Lord when he gave God's prophecy to the, to the people. And so when Pentecost came, you see, we, we see the same thing happening. That's not, that's not new. That's not new. The Spirit did the same thing on Pentecost when he equipped the apostles for their task. The miraculous uh, ability to speak in languages they had not learned. And the Holy Spirit gave testimony. The, the apostles were given the gospel. Jesus had promised them that they would be told what to say. And he promised them that, that they would never speak anything but the truth. Folks, that's not, that's not new. Those things happen in the Old Testament. But something new did happen in the New Covenant. And the, the new thing that happened was the indwelling power, indwelling power. That's what's new on the day of Pentecost. Never before in the Old Testament was the Spirit of God promised to individuals universally that everyone would be a, 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 have the ability to receive the, the Holy Spirit. The, the purpose of indwelling is, again, power. It's power to assist us in our spiritual warfare to help us overcome Satan and his power. Here's what Paul said in Romans 8, 13. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. You, you got bad habits and bad things that you do in your life that you want to stop, but you don't just seem like you can't stop them. God put his, if you're a Christian, God put his spirit in you to give you power to stop them. You just have to use it, and you have to take advantage of it. So that had never been available before. And so we see both of those things on the, on the day of Pentecost, the equipping power and the indwelling power. The equipping power, we saw it when, when it says, all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. That's not new. I mean, it was new for them, but it's not new that the Holy Spirit provided that miraculous ability to equip them. But then we have the indwelling power. And, it said, and Peter said, repent and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That was promised to everyone who accepted Christ. That was new. That was new. That's part of the new covenant. Then the third thing is the church was purposeful. And there's four things that I picked out that demonstrate that. First of all, they were devoted. In Acts 2.42, it says they, talking about the church, were continually devoting themselves 
to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. They were devoting themselves to these things, the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. In fact, the, at times, the meeting of the church was called the, the fellowship of, of believers, to the breaking of bread. Now, I understand that in, in the New Testament, sometimes breaking of bread just speaks about eating together. Sometimes breaking of bread speaks about the Lord's Supper. I, my personal opinion is that here it's talking about the Lord's Supper. And the reason I believe that is because it seems to me these four things are kind of in the context of the church being together to worship. Might be wrong, but either way, either way, there was fellowship and there was breaking of bread and there was prayer. Those are things that the people devoted themselves to. I just thought when I put that on the screen, um, do we devote ourselves to those things? Uh, we, we fall short, I'm sure, in devo devoting ourselves to those things. Then secondly, they were benevolent. They took care of one another. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. They, they shared what they had. They were, they were benevolent. And I think there's another place in Acts where it says no one had any needs because they took care of one another. Um, one of the first issues in the church had to do with the fairness of their benevolence. It's in Acts chapter 6. You can read that. Third, there were, they were communal. Now, my wife, in between services, pointed out my mistake here, okay? So uh, I just want you to know, as I put this scripture up here, it says Acts 4, 32 to 25. Well, that obviously can't be right. So it's, what is it, 35? 35? Okay, so here, this talks about them being communal, okay? And, and the congregation of those who believed were one heart and soul, and not one of them claimed that anything belonged to him was his, anything that belonged, I'm sorry, anything belonging to him was his own. But all things were common property to them. The, the, they... You know, this isn't communism, it's common sense is what it is. And they were, they were communal in sharing. And finally, they were growing. They were growing. They began with 3,000. Um, and those, those 3,000 then grew, according to Luke, in Acts chapter 4, to the number of men being 5,000, not counting the women and, and children. But that's just in Jerusalem. On the day of Pentecost, the people that heard the gospel were from countries everywhere. That's why the, the, the miraculous languages were, were given so people from all different nations who were there to celebrate Passover could hear the gospel and take it home. So I don't know how many conversions there were when they took the gospel home with them. We're not told, but I believe there were a lot as people heard the gospel in their language, in their home country. But they had grown in Jerusalem in just a few short, probably weeks, to uh, 5,000 men. The, the key verse in all of this is, it says, and the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. So God was adding people every day to his church. Fourth thing is that they were principled. I'd love to talk to you more about this, but I would just encourage you to read Acts chapter 5. That's the story of Ananias and Sapphira. And God struck them dead because they lied to the, to the Holy Spirit about what they had given to the church. Any of you a little nervous now? <laughs> it, it 
wasn't how much they gave. It was the deception in all of it. They were lying. Why is that such a big deal? That's an incredibly big deal. God is truth. If there's any place on earth where you should hear the truth, it should be the church. And, and our enemy, our enemy is the father of all lies. Lying was incredibly significant. And the church was principled. And they stood, and both Ananias and his wife Sapphira were, were killed because of their use of deception. The, another time, the apostles were commanded not to preach. They didn't say, oh, no, no problem, we'll, we'll call a halt here for a while. No, they, they said, we must obey God rather than men. The church was principled from day one. The church was persecuted. persecuted. The, and it began even before the first gospel sermon was preached. I went through all the first eight chapters of Acts, and here were four accounts of persecution that I found. On the very first day before the gospel was preached, the, they were accused of being drunk. Don't listen to them. They're just drunk. In Acts chapter 5, the apostles were arrested. In Acts 7 and 8 is the account of Stephen being arrested and then stoned. He, be, he was the first martyr. And in Acts chapter 8 verse 1, it says that great persecution occurred against the church. Things did not improve with time. Persecution became a way of life, first from the Jews and then from the Romans. Tradition says that all of the apostles, but the apostle John, suffered martyrdom. And down through history, even today, there has been and continues to be great persecution of followers of Jesus Christ. And finally... The church was prevailing, prevailing. Jesus promised that his church would not be overcome. Upon this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower. God gave us an entire book in the New Testament to make sure we understood that he would prevail. That, that's what I think the book of Revelation is. I don't, I don't, I don't think the Rev, book of Revelation is designed to give us a path to the end. I think it's a book that tells us whenever the end comes, we will have endured great persecution. But don't bail. Don't bail out. You hang in there because God will prevail. That's, that's the purpose of the book of Revelation. It's a book of encouragement. And it was written to tell us, don't give up. Don't give up. So what do I want to leave you with? Well, I, I feel compelled when I talk about the church to, to say and remind you that no church is going to save you. If you think that belonging to a church somewhere will save you and give you eternal life, you need, you need to think again. No one will be saved because they are a member of some church. If you're a Catholic, that Catholic church isn't going to save you. If you're a Methodist, that Methodist church isn't going to save you. If you're Baptist, well, we know the Baptist church isn't going to save you. <laughs> and New Life Christian Church won't save you. We are saved because of the redemptive work of Christ. We are saved by accepting the sacrifice of Christ. We're not saved by joining a church. Let me put that scripture I had up here just a few minutes ago. 
And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. Two things in that verse that I thought was interesting. First of all, it's the Lord who adds to the church. You can't do it. I can't do it. We can put your name on a ledger somewhere, but that doesn't add you to the church. The Lord is the one who adds you to the church. And the Lord adds to the church the people who are saved. He doesn't add people to the church in order to save them. He adds the ones who have been saved to the church. So I, I, I believe that unless you have made a mental decision to surrender your life to Jesus and to accept the sacrificial work that he did on the cross to pay for your sins. And you're living in a way that demonstrates your commitment and your, uh, your devotion to Jesus. That unless, you're, unless that's your situation, I, I don't see any way that you can be saved. Now, obviously, I'm not the one who determines who is saved and who is not. That makes a lot of you happy. <laughs> and it makes me happy, too. That's just an observation based on what I see uh, in, in the scriptures. It, just tell me. If, if you're not a follower of Jesus... You have not accepted his saving work. Tell, tell me, on what basis will you be able to stand before God and say, God, I deserve to be with you for eternity? What are you going to tell him? I think that's one of the reasons I love the, the hymn, Just As I Am. Because it starts out, just as I am without one plea. There's nothing, there's nothing that any of us can say to God that makes us worthy of heaven. What are you going to tell him? You came to church most of the time? You treated your neighbor good? But then the second line of that song, just as I am without one plea, but that your blood was shed for me. Ah, that'll do it. That'll do it. But you need to apply that blood to your life. And I'd love to speak to you about that. We would love to speak to you about that. Be you, you can have your very own day of Pentecost. <laughs> you, you can accept Christ like they did. You can be baptized like they did. You can begin a journey of learning what it means to follow Jesus. But you have to do what they did when, and say, what do I need to do? We have a room. It's, we just call it room 150. It's out that door and across the hall. And someone there will tell you what you need to do. You need to accept Christ. And if you do, then God will add you to his church. Let me pray. Father, I thank you for the power that we see demonstrated in your church on that day of Pentecost. And we marvel at the power that we have seen demonstrated down through the centuries. But what makes us marvel even more is the power that you have placed within us to overcome everything that Satan would desire to do to us. And I just pray that you would help us to use that power. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. And again, as we start the song here in a few minutes, if uh, you need to do that, you go right out there to room 150 and somebody will be waiting there for you. Well, a lot of times at the end of the service, we end with kind of a, a slow meditative uh, worship song, and sometimes we don't. Sometimes we do what we're getting ready to do. I'm so thankful. Uh, Lyle, who sings a lot here, him and Susan always write these wonderful songs, and he came to me about a month ago and said, hey, I've got this song about Pentecost. And I was like, okay, I wasn't sure what Matt was going to do over a month ago about that, but uh, 
Anyway, we just thought, well, gosh, Matt's going to give this wonderful sermon about Pentecost, and then Lyle and Susan wrote this song that uh, really talks about that and kind of uh, goes through that, and we thought, hmm, he just explained it. This would be a great song to end the service with. Well, in typical Lyle and Susan fashion, this is going to be a fun song. All right, so we're in with an upbeat song today, but we hope that you enjoy it this morning, and Lyle and Amy are singing a duet. The apostles were together as Jesus had decreed, waiting for the promised paraclete. Not sure what help was coming or how their lives would change, would Jesus' earthly mission be complete? Then came the heavenly wind, bringing tongues of fire upon them. A miracle oh, that stirred their very souls. The Holy Spirit filled them. They were given awesome powers. Christ's earthly church was ready to unfold. I will pour out my spirit, says the Lord. These words were given to the prophet Joel. Your young men will have visions. Your old men will dream dreams. The Holy Spirit's coming was foretold. Then came the heavenly wind, bringing tongues of fire upon them. A miracle that stirred their very soul. Holy Spirit filled them, they were given awesome powers. Christ's earthly church was ready to unfold. Then Peter gave a sermon to the crowd who were amazed. Though different tongues they all could comprehend. Repent and be baptized in Christ, and he'll forgive your sins. His Holy Spirit then will dwell within. Then came the heavenly wind, bringing tongues of fire upon them, a miracle that stirred their very souls. The Holy Spirit filled them, they were given awesome power. Christ's earthly church was ready to unfold. Well, now you know the story and what you have to do. Our loving God has done his part. The rest is up to you. Then came the heavenly wind, the bringing tongues of fire upon them, a miracle that caused them to be born. The Holy Spirit filled them, thousands gave their lives to Christ. His earthly church is something to behold. The Holy Spirit filled them, thousands gave their lives to Christ. His earthly church is something to behold. That's a great, great song. And I know what you're thinking. They did in five minutes what it took me 30 to do. So, so anyway, don't clap. Don't. We're really glad that you were here. Uh, today is the last Sunday of the month, so next Sunday is the day we collect the food for the local food uh, pantry. And if you would bring a bag of non-perishable items uh, and put them in the bins, that'd be great. Uh, also, I wanted to share with you uh, that on September the 10th, this building will be t uh, six years old. And so we've, in the last year, we've been experiencing some of the wear and tear. We've replaced some things. And, uh, and we thought, like, maybe it's time to take a look and 
freshen up our auditorium. I'm freshen up the foyer. So I'm just telling you that we have, we're looking at some different ideas and you may come in here and maybe see some different colors or maybe some different furniture or some different arrangements. And I just didn't want you to freak out. So um, just uh, all of it we're doing and it w is to help us to make this place uh, better for you and a warm and welcoming for those who come. So just be aware that there is that taking place. Uh, Mike's going to dismiss us. All right. Well, again, guests, if uh, you're a first time guest with us and you filled out that little side flap, please don't forget as you leave today, go out the right side. We've got a gift for you and we want to give that to you today. And also, if you want to check out all the different ministries and things you can sign up for as you leave, go out to the left over here, these desks over here, you can see all the things that we're doing here at New Life Christian Church. All right. Well, we're glad that you're here. We hope that you have a great rest of the weekend and a great day tomorrow. Let's pray and we'll be dismissed. Father, thank you so much for what you're doing here today, Lord, and it really is all about you. We give you the glory and praise for all that you're doing. Protect us as we leave. Bring us back safe next time, for it's in your name we pray. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed. Have a great weekend.